let's get going with today's lesson then. We started this lesson last week. I did not get through the outline. I didn't want to keep you all day. And so I thought we'd finish it this week, it being such an important issue. We are at the place in our verse by verse through Ephesians study that we're in Ephesians 3 verse 9, around that part there, where Paul says that he was given this information, this dispensation of grace, this revelation of the mystery, and that he was given this commission uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ and his grace to the Gentiles. And then in verse 9, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Uh, this verse, this mission that's described in Ephesians chapter 3 for the church, the body of Christ, is often not talked about. People don't know it exists. And when you talk about a commission in churches, typically it's Matthew 28. Go to all nations, uh, teaching them everything I commanded you baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, right? That's the commission. Um, so people water baptize everyone and teach them the law, which is to love God and love your neighbor, and that's their mission to the world. Uh, so that there's a lot of doctrinal issues in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24. We know our mission is found in 2 Corinthians 5 as ambassadors. Our mission is found in Ephesians 3, verse 9, to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And so that's why we do what we do. And we started last week describing how to do that, and uh, the first step was to learn it. You know, it may seem commonsensical, but it, it, it's, it's needed to say that you can't make others see what you don't. Right? So we're to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery. If you don't know what is the fellowship of the mystery, you can't make anyone else see it. In the same way, if you don't know what Jesus sent <clears throat> his 12 disciples, his 12 apostles to go teach the nations, you won't know what to teach them. You know, everyone likes that first word in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. It says, Go. Go to nations, right? So you preach on go, right? But Jesus said, teaching them whatever I commanded you. Do you know what Jesus commanded them to teach? Right? He commanded them to keep the law of Moses. He commanded them to sell everything they had. He commanded them to offer sacrifices. But you don't hear that, do you? And so this idea of knowing what it is that Jesus Christ wants you to preach and what it is God wants you to make known is important. And so uh, we'll be talking today how to do that. But first, the preface is you got to know it first. You got to see it. And um, <clears throat> just a matter of encouragement, if you don't know it, if you don't see it, <clears throat> this is the right place to learn it, okay? If you don't see what is the Fellowship of the Mystery, you don't, just don't understand it yet, ask, please, okay? Read the literature. We have printed out tracts and things in the back in case you want to do that privately. Read the Bible on your own. Study on your own to figure out what it is. You can find it in Paul's epistles, Ephesians primarily, Okay, Second Corinthians, First Corinthians talks about it, Romans talks about it. And if you still can't understand it, then ask your questions. This is why we give an hour every Sunday before our teaching for questions and answers. Okay, to ask your questions so that not only you can benefit, but the rest of us. Joe asked a question this morning, and the rest of you heard me lecture for 20 minutes. That's how that works. And so we love the questions. Ask the questions, and we'll cover the material. Even if it's repetitive, we'll do it. Because what we're trying to do here is not simply to affirm each other as saved people. Okay, what we're trying to do is equip ourselves as workmen, right? And so to do that means that if you're weak in an area, you've got to say, look, I, I, I need to get this. I'm going out to battle this week. I'm going out to do some ministry this week, and I don't get that. I'm weak there. I need to know what this means, right? Good. Let's get each other equipped. Let's strengthen each other, edify one another in the knowledge of the truth, okay? So please ask. Um, it is not going to be a good thing if you don't. By the way, that's a pretty good life principle as well. If you don't know how to do something, find out or ask, right? Um, you're going to end up making a mess when you don't know how to do things right and you try to do them, okay? So try to investigate this stuff out. But in Ephesians 3, verse 9, when it says we're to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, often people emphasize the wrong part of this verse when they do read it, okay? You've heard the word fellowship thrown around churches left and right. Churches will put this in their name, Fellowship Church. We have on the front Grace Ambassadors Bible Fellowship, right? They talk about fellowshipping, the fellowship hall. And they'll emphasize the fellowship as a word to make all men see what is the fellowship, right? Of, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> that's how they read it, right? But really the emphasis is on the mystery, the fellowship of the mystery, okay? Fellowship, first of all, does not refer at all to what you do. Understand this. And so when the church announces in their bulletin, next week we're going to have Sunday service, and afterwards, fellowship, which means you meet with coffee downstairs and you chat about the game that comes after, that is not what the Bible describes as fellowship. Okay, Fellowship is not what you do, it's not how you treat one another. 
People think this. Well, we're in a fellowship, right? So how you treat one another, this is how you make men see our fellowship. So show love with one another, treat each other good, and as God would want you to treat each other, and that's making men see the fellowship, right? That, that, that's not what the word is, okay? The fellowship refers to what we have with God. I don't like using the word relationship because of the cultural baggage that comes with it, but th that's what it is. It's our relationship to Jesus, not the intimate, how do you love the Lord more? But what, how is it that we are connected, partnered with the Lord? Okay, how is it that we are in this fellowship, this joint interest? Another way to say it is, how are we in communion with the Lord? Right? What is our obligation, our responsibility, our position? How does the God relate to us, how we to them? Okay? It's important when you talk about that fellowship to understand that God doesn't always relate to people in the Bible the same way. Thus, dispensational Bible study. Right? But the fellowship has to do with your partnership, your communion with Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9, Paul says this to the Corinthians. So we're to make all men see what is the fellowship. It's not talking about how we treat one another. Well, those Christians at that church, they're really nice to me. And I, I really felt welcome when I came there. That's a nice fellowship. Nice people, sure. But that is not what Ephesians 3 is talking about. Okay. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9. Now the Corinthians... One of the most carnal church that Paul writes about in two. He says in chapter one, verse nine, God is faithful. Whether or not the Corinthians are faithful is irrelevant at this point. God is faithful is what Paul says, by whom ye were called unto the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You see that word ye there? Okay, do you have a Bible that has the ye's? Good. You need them there. Okay. The these and the thou's and the ye's communicate something to you about your language. It is not Old English. It is English. Okay? No one said in 1611, ye and thou. They didn't talk like that on the streets. Right? But what it is, is English to tell you that either you're talking to a single person or you're talking to a group of people. That's what it means. Plural or singular. If you see a Y, you, or a Y, ye, it means he's talking to a group of people. Okay? If you see a thee or a thou, he's talking to one person or a single entity. Okay? That's what the difference is. And that will help you in many places where both thee and ye are used in the same sentence. It's interesting. Well, this helps you here because he says, God is faithful by whom ye, who's he talking to? The whole group. All the Corinthians. By ye all. Right? That's a good way to remember it. The people in sub, southern states in America say ye all. Right? Well, it's the same idea. Plural. Right? Ye were called unto the fellowship of of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, the Corinthians, their fellowship had nothing to do with how they treat each other. In fact, you read the book of Corinthians, they didn't really treat each other that great. Okay, that's what he's rebuking them about, about how they didn't treat each other that great. But they all had the fellowship. What does that mean? It's not how you treat one another, and it's not what you do. It's what you have with God. And here it says the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ. All the Corinthians who believed the gospel were in communion, had a partnership, were joined together with Jesus Christ by the gospel, the grace of God. Okay? And so when we talk about making all men see what is the fellowship, we're talking about our connection, our relationship to God. Right? That's what we're talking about. And so we need to make people see how it is they can relate, how they can communicate, how they can be connected to God. That's what we're trying to make them see. All right? I'm trying to get around the, the baggage of that word fellowship. That's what it is. And what is this fellowship that we have, this fellowship of the mystery? Because throughout the Bible, God has always had a people that were God's people, right? There's always been people who were joining in God's endeavor, in his will. I mean, Israel, Adam, Abel, Noah. There's always been people working with God to do something, right? But Paul says we're to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, so see, the emphasis isn't on the fellowship. There's always been the people who do what God wants them to do. Here it's the fellowship of the mystery. That's the fellowship that was not known before. The fellowship that was kept secret. See? So we're not to make all men see just how you can have a relationship with God and pick a random verse from the Bible and see how David related to God. You can relate to God the same way. No, we're to make men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. You see? That's what Paul says. So that's the emphasis. What is this mystery? Because God's fellowship with humanity, his partnership with humanity, has not always been according to the mystery. In time past, his partnership with humanity was limited to a nation, and that through covenants, right? 
And so we're to make omen see the fellowship that we have with Christ and with God according to the mystery. Now, what is this mystery? Again, this is all preface here because you can't make men see something you don't yourself see. So we're trying to, to lay down here what it is. The mystery fellowship, which is exactly what we're studying in our Tuesday verse by verse. We've been doing it for, what, 19 weeks now? Man, we're really going slow through this book because this is our material in Ephesians. Right? It's for the church, the body of Christ. And it explains this mystery, this fellowship of mystery. This fellowship, partnership with Christ is, I put it real simply on your outline there, the mystery fellowship is the new creature, the body of Christ. That's what it is. Okay. If you don't know what it is, that's what it is. If you don't know what that means or what the implications of that are, that's what we're supposed to study and learn. But that's what we're trying to make people see. That God is no longer working with, connecting to the world through a nation called Israel, through his covenants that he gave to them, the circumcision covenants, the law covenants. Okay, He's not working through the law, which is all over the Old Testament. right? The fellowship of the mystery, the partnership with God that we have is according to the mystery, which is the body of Christ. This church, the body of Christ, this new creature was not known before. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. Ephesians 3, verse 6. Just a couple of verses here to show you. And you can do some more study on your own about, about this body of Christ issue, this new creature, because there's plenty of verses about it. But Ephesians 3, verse 6, when Paul says in verse 3 and 4, that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Okay. In verse uh, 5, in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. In verse 6, here's what it is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise. In Christ by the gospel. The mystery is that you all, Gentiles, which that means everybody, okay, nations, that everyone uh, should be fellow heirs. The implication there is with Christ. I hope you don't have an NIV Bible because it'll mess you up here. The NIV Bible says fellow heirs with Israel, and that totally destroys the teaching of the fellowship of the mystery. Okay? They add the words Israel, which don't belong there at all, they change your Bible. So you get the right Bible here, but in Ephesians 3, verse 6, it says that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs with Christ, is the idea. And of the same body, of Christ, is the idea. And partakers of his promise, in Christ, by the gospel of Christ. Right, that's the mystery. Okay. So how do we relate to God? Well, we need to trust the gospel of Christ. And then we relate to God because now we're the same body of Christ. We partake of his promises and the riches that we have in Christ. And we're fellow heirs with Christ in the future. Right, and now and in the future. That is the mystery. There's a lot in there that you can unpack. We're not going to this morning, but that's what it is. Now, at this point, we're going to move forward, and the question that you might be asking is, well, this seems very technical almost, right? So we've got to understand what God's doing and all this fellow air and same body, and that's a lot of stuff. Can't we just go and preach the gospel, right? Well, which one, right? What's the gospel? You see, this is the question. You may be having the question of why, well, why make them see this? Why is it God says you need to see this right here? Why not something else? Right? Well, the answer is in 1 Timothy 2, verse 4, where Paul says that God's will is that all men be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Okay? God's will, salvation, knowledge of the truth. That's why he wants you to make all men see the fellowship of the mystery. All right? Number one, it's what God is, it's what God is doing. Period. Boom. If you don't know what God's doing, you don't understand the mystery of Christ. That's just bottom line. And we're not born knowing what God is doing. You've got to read and learn it, right? But the fact of the matter is, if you don't know what God is doing, you don't know the fellowship of the mystery of Christ, right? If you don't know salvation, you don't know what is the fellowship of the mystery of Christ, right? Salvation is only found in the body of Christ. You only find the gospel that saves you in this teaching about what Christ did on your behalf, the gospel of the grace of God, right? And thirdly, when Paul says it's God's will that all men be saved and come to knowledge of the truth, God's will doesn't stop when you get saved. Oh, I'm saved. That, that's, I'm good. God wants you to come to knowledge of the truth. And that knowledge of the truth will help you grow in Christ, help you know who you are in Christ. I put on your outline there. It'll help you know your identity, your position, your calling. It explains who God made you to be. And so apart from just salvation, if you're wondering, who does God want me to be? What does God want me to do? This is contained in the fellowship of the mystery of Christ. Your relationship, partnership, workmanship with Jesus Christ, according to the mystery. Right? 
If you don't know what that is, you're praying for God's calling, you don't know your identity in Christ, then this is, again, it's an expression that you don't know what is the fellowship of the mystery. And that's fine. Ignorance can be cured. It was cured for me in part. I'm still ignorant of lots of things, right? But we cure ignorance by coming to the knowledge of the truth and learning what it says. So that's why we make men see this. So, so far we've talked about what it is and why men need to see it. The reason why there's so much salvation confusion, confusion about God's will, confusion about our identity as Christians, is because people do not know the fellowship of the mystery. They're trying to have fellowship with God any old way from any passage of the Bible, and they don't know the fellowship of the mystery. Okay, so this is significant. All right, are we good with that? Can we move on? We move on to what the lesson's about, which is how to make other men see it. Right. Before you make other men see, you've got to know yourself. And so, next point is, how do you teach it to other people? You have to learn it first. Secondly, you've got to learn to teach it to others, which is different than you knowing it. Right? It's different than you learning it, because you just hear and you learn and you, you can comprehend it in your brain. You ever had the experience where you know something and you just can't say it? You ever had the experience where it, it, it sounded better in my brain, then when it came out, it, just, it didn't sound right. In your brain, it made sense. When you said the words, you sounded like an idiot. Does this ever happen to you? It happens to me all the time. I mean, I'm talking up here. And there's things in my brain, I'm going, it sounded better on, you know, on the inside than on the outside. But this is what happens. It's different learning something than teaching it to other people. Okay? And so we need to also learn not only what it is that we need to know and see, but as we're doing ministry work, to learn how to make others see. Okay? How to do that ministry. And hopefully this is more applicable to many of you. Okay, who are growing, maturing in the doctrine and, and learning what it is and, and, and trying to do a conversation and ministry work with other people. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says our goal is to teach faithful men to teach others also. And in 2 Timothy 2.24, the admonition is very apt, where Paul says you need to be gentle, patient, apt to teach. Right? All these things are, are necessary. So when you read 1 and 2 Timothy, you read Titus, you read Philemon, these are useful books for you, okay, because you're also to make all men see you may not be the pastor, which Timothy was, but you're to do the similar ministry as Timothy did or support ministry like that. So you need to know these principles, these spiritual uh, 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 tools that you need to use. Okay. We started last week talking about this and how the best way to teach someone what is the fellowship of the mystery is to compare and contrast verses in their Bible. Okay. And here I'm talking primarily uh, to people who say that they're Christians who give some sort of value to this book as God's word. The polls still say, even though our culture is not ran by the Bible anymore, the polls still say that of the 80-85% of people in America that call themselves Christians, they highly value this book, even though they don't read it. <laughs> it's like The majority of them value the book, and yet only a small percentage actually read it. But this is to your advantage, okay? because to make all men see it, if they say they're Christians and they value the book, you can use the book. Uh, yesterday in my email tip, I wrote that, you know, you should start a small Bible study group. And a good way to do that, um, or a good reason to do that, is because many people who call themselves Christians value the Bible. Or they understand it or not. And so it's not something that's very, uh, it's not very confrontational to say, let's study the Bible. <laughs> you know, what Christian would say, no, oh, I don't do that sort of thing, you know. That's going to be a rare find. And so having a little Bible study group in your home or in your family is a good, a good way to do ministry work, a good way to do evangelism, actually. You know, people think of evangelism and they think of someone on, on the street handing out tracts or someone with a megaphone preaching, and this is one way to do it, right? And we do that. But there's also, hey, let's come over and have a Bible study. Because evangelism is the task of you persuading someone who doesn't know or disagrees what the truth is. That's what evangelism is. There's only two ways to deal with people who don't know the truth. Okay? You either evangelize them, which means you communicate the truth to them and try to persuade them of it, or you compromise. Either evangelize or compromise. Compromise means I don't tell them what the truth is, I don't try to change their mind, I just let them continue in their error and not knowing that there's truth. Right? So there's, there's only two options. That's it. I encourage you to evangelize, right? to communicate truth to people. And you do that through a Bible study, where you can invite them over, you do a Bible study on a topic, or go through a book or something, and, and you can have the conversation. It's a, it's a somewhat of a safe environment. Because unlike here, where we're trying to train and equip workmen, where they may feel a little intimidated that, you know, look, I'm not one of these workmen yet, you know. I don't even know what you believe. In a small Bible study environment, you're able to 
to have an environment of study of the scripture where there's no pressure of you being like the rest of us or being a part of our ministry or anything else, right? So uh, it's a really good ministry to do. Um, and you can do that at home or online or whatever. So meanwhile, learning how to teach others is, is significant. And comparing and contrasting verses is a good way to do that. Okay. On our, out, on our website, we have some hundred different Bible contradictions. Okay. Bible comparisons. And we're going to go through some here in the next 20 minutes or so. Okay. Last week, we started with the gospel. Remember that? Compare and contrast verses regarding the gospel. Because it's very easy to do to look back at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see that they did not know what, that Christ would die, that Christ would raise from the dead. They didn't know the very gospel that saves you, which is Christ died, from, died for your sins and rose from the dead. They didn't know it. Okay, the, the, you show them the difference, and then you wait for it to percolate and to seep down into their brain. And maybe you wait days, let them think about it. Don't let them ignore it, because this is often what happens when people don't understand something. They just put it under the rug and forget it. So later, bring it up again. You know, when time passes, say, did you think about that anymore? What do you think of that? You know, let me show you what I think is the issue. Let, let them wrangle on the hook a little bit, then give them the solution. <laughs> so they're not going crazy over it. You know, maybe they'll learn something. Maybe they'll see it. Okay. But comparing to contrasting is a good way to do that. Look at 1 John 2, verse 7. The gospel is a good place to start because that way you can affirm their salvation. There's no use trying to make men see their relationship to Christ if they have none, if they're not saved. Right? In 1 John 2, verse 7, the Apostle John says a very interesting thing. 1 John 2, verse 7. He says, Brethren, I write no new commandment, uh, brethren, I write no new commandment uh, unto you, but an old commandment, which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and true light now shines. I think I'm wanting verse 17. Um, thank you, sir. I lost the two. I need first John 2 27. And verse 26. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. The anointing which ye have received of him abides in you. Did you know you were anointed? Jeopardy music, right? Did you know you were anointed? The anointing which you have received of him abides in you. And ye need not that any man teach you. First John is a book that Christians love because the word love is mentioned so often in it, right? Uh, people who don't understand the mystery of Christ or how to write it by the scripture will teach First John as if it's a doctrine for you. And they'll quote First John 2.27 when it says that ye have need not that any man teach you. I've had people tell me when I emphasize the importance of Scripture, they tell me, well, Christians aren't united around the Bible. We're united around the Holy Spirit. You ever, you ever heard this? That I don't need to understand the Scripture if the Holy Spirit teaches me. You ever heard this? Or that God spoke to me or God told me. These sorts of statements come from 1 John, Acts chapter 2, Old Testament prophets and all that. Where 1 John 2.27 says, you need not that any man should teach you. Okay, he says, but as the same anointed teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. So the Holy Spirit's teaching these people things by anointing that they don't need a teacher. Right? Now, turn to 2 Timothy 2.15. <clears throat> Some of you don't have to turn there. In 2 Timothy 2.15, the first word of the verse is what? Study. Excuse me, what? Study? Because 1 John 2.27 says, you have an anointing from the Holy Spirit that you need not that any man teach you. Right? And 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study to show thyself approved unto God. Well, if God's the one that gives the anointing of 1 John 2, then why is he also telling us to study in 2 Timothy 2.15? You see, there's a difference here. Look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. These are some comparisons of, about different topics that you can show people that the Bible <clears throat> is not all talking about you. The Bible, all of the scripture is profitable, but it's not all instructive to you. In Luke chapter 12, verse 11. Jesus is speaking. And he says, When they bring you into the synagogues, unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. Now, our lesson this morning, I prepared. I've been working on it for a few weeks now, okay? 
and it's titled How to Make Men See. The point is to try to communicate to you how to make other people see, right? Are we disobeying Jesus? Because Jesus says, when they bring you to the synagogues or the magistrates, take no thought how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say. Don't even think about it, right? Now, if you don't like study, this is what 2 Timothy 2.15 says, you'll love this verse because you don't do it at all. You don't think about what you're going to say because in the next verse, verse 12, Jesus says, the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. Did you not know that verse was in the Bible? Maybe you didn't. Maybe other people don't know it's there either. I'm trying to show you a difference, a contrast between the verse we have posted on the wall in the back, study, should have approved, and 1 John 2.27, and Luke 12, 12, that says, don't worry about studying. You have an anointing. The Holy Ghost will tell you what to say. Right? And so when a preacher comes up here and says, I got a word from the Lord. You ever heard that? I got a fresh word. The Holy Ghost just spoke to me. They're communicating doctrine from 1 John 2, 27. Doctrine from Luke chapter 12, verse 12. Right? But it's doctrine that is the opposite of 2 Timothy 2, 15. Either you study to know what to say, or you don't think about it, and you come up on Sunday, or to your, you just, whatever comes to your mouth, whatever comes to your head, you just say. Right? There's a difference. And so you need to show people that difference and ask them, which one are we to do? Are we not to think about it, or are we to think about it? Look at Titus chapter 1. Because <clears throat> someone's wrong. <laughs> Either we're focused too much on study, or... Other people aren't studying enough. <clears throat> in Titus chapter 1, in verse 9, Paul tells Titus to hold fast the faithful word as he hath been taught. Taught by who? 1 John 2 says the Holy Ghost will teach you. Luke 12 says the Holy Ghost will teach you. Paul says, remember who taught you these things. I did. Paul taught Titus these things. He says, Hold fast faithful words you've been taught, that he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. If you want a verse talking about preparation, that's the verse right there. Right? Study and prepare yourself so that you're able to convince the gainsayers. Which means you've got to think about what the gainsayers are going to gain. Do you know what gainsayer means? Someone who says something against you. That's where the word comes from. Literally. It's a gainsayer. He's against me. He's going to say it against me. So you got to think about what the opposition is going to say. And then you got to think about how can I convince that opposition about the truth? There's a lot of study that goes into that. Think about back and forth and think about in the scripture. What is the truth and how can I convince them of the truth? And so that when the gainsayer comes, you've got a response, right? There's all sorts of apologetic ministries that work on this principle. And good. They should be studying to be able to convince the gainsayers. But they're not following Jesus' instructions in Luke 12, 12. When he said, don't take any thought what you're going to say, the Holy Ghost will tell you. And that will not work in this dispensation. Right? If, if Christians are following that advice, and many are, you have a bunch of ignorant Christians who don't know what to say and don't say things right, and they're not communicating clearly. Okay? You will never make someone see something that you don't yourself first see. Let's move on here. <clears throat> something a little more light, perhaps. Talking about the gospel, talking about studying the scripture. This is heavy stuff, but what about what you eat? We've done dispensational charts here about this topic, and it's, it's a way you can show people how to see the, this fellowship of the mystery. Okay? Because it's interesting how God's menu changes throughout the scripture. What God wants you to eat changes. Which is fascinating because many people don't consider God too much when they eat. I mean, there's the prayer in the beginning, obligatory prayer, right before they eat, thank God for the food. But do you ever think that God has given you instruction on what's on your plate? Right? Some people know that the Bible does talk about that. And here's the, the truth of it. We're not even talking about whether it matters to God or not what you eat, but that God's instructions on what you eat has changed. So which one do we follow? In Genesis 1 verse 29, God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and he did not create the animals and said, Adam, name the animals and then fry them on the barbie. You know, He didn't say that. He's, he said, name the animals and don't eat them. In Genesis 1 29, he says, Behold, I have given you every herb-bearing seed to put on your pork, pork sandwich. You know, No, every herb-bearing seed which is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you shall be for me. Fruits and nuts, that's what they eat. Seeds, 
You're going, man, I need my meatloaf. Well, in Genesis 1, if you're in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, you're not having it. Okay? Now, you can question and imagine what kind of fruit they had there. It's none of this watered-down GMO stuff. You can talk about all that. But whatever it was, it wasn't animals. Okay? Now, moving on to Levit uh, Genesis chapter 9, verse 3. A mere eight chapters later, after the flood, when God tells Noah to get off the boat, Remember the animals? How many animals got on the ark? They, go, well, they went by what? Not two by two. Don't say two by two. All the pictures say two by two. But when Noah got off the ark, God says, fry up one of those animals. He offered an animal sacrifice. So God didn't tell Adam to do that. But when Noah got off the ark, Noah offered an animal sacrifice. Which means if they only went on two by two, <laughs> Noah just made extinct one entire species of animal. Right? I mean, sorry, we don't like you, dinosaur. We'll fry you up. There you go. That's why the dinosaurs weren't extinct, apparently. Noah sacrificed them after the flood. Right? No, that's, that's not the case. But in Genesis 9, verse 3, the instruction God gave to Noah was that every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. The Bible word for meat means food, right? Shall be meat, food for you. Even as the green herb I've given you. So I've given you the herb to eat. You can still eat the herbs. But now you can put it on your steak, Right? The menu has changed. You see, this is a very simple, very lighthearted type of thing, and yet it helps people to see that not everything in the Bible is their instructions, right? Because there are Christians today who will say that it's God's divine design that we be vegetarians. Can you get that from the Bible? Yes. Genesis 1.29 teaches that. You can claim God's word. It says, God's word says we should not eat meat. Yep, 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 you're right. Keep reading. Genesis 9 verse 3, he told Noah, eat the meat. Right? And some Christians will say, well, yeah, eat the meat, but you can't eat every kind of meat. I mean, don't you know that pigs eat the, the slop? You know, eat cows. Cows, you know, they're holy animals, according to the Hindu religion. They eat grass. So uh, if you're not going to eat the grass, at least eat the animals that eat the grass. Pigs don't eat the grass. They root around and eat slop and stuff. Dirty animals, right? So don't eat pork, because in Leviticus, chapter 11, verse 2, there are clean and unclean animals, and God told Israel not to eat pork, Right? Now, again, I'm, I'm, I'm sometimes simple-minded, and, and pigs, they do move around, don't they? They do move. Pigs move, right? God told Noah, you can eat every moving thing. Any moving thing that liveth, you can eat. And then later, in Leviticus chapter 11, he told Israel, which was hundreds of years after Noah, don't eat these kinds of animals. You can't eat the kangaroo, you can't eat the rabbit, you can't eat the pig, right? You can't eat the flies. There are animals you can't eat. Okay, you can eat... The, the cow, right? You can eat, what is it, the grasshopper, the locust, which is what John the Baptist was eating, locust. It was a clean animal, okay? And so the, the menu has changed again in Leviticus 11, verse 2. Now in Acts chapter 10, you're showing people this, and, and the whole goal of this is to, to get them to think about, they need to be able to think about what God is doing in the Bible and when. Because if they randomly go to the scripture, God's menu is changing. What's interesting about this is the teaching actually goes deeper than just God's menu because God's menu reflects other ways he relates to humanity. In the Garden of Eden, there was no sin and thus no death. So you don't kill the animals, right? After the fall and sin entered the world, there was death. Okay, after the flood, he says, eat the animals, right? And he instituted the death penalty in Genesis chapter 9. But then with Israel, he calls out one nation and says, you're going to be a special nation different from the other nations, which means the food you're going to eat is going to be different than the other food the other people eat. You see, his menu reflects his operation in the world. Okay. Acts 10, verse 14 is going to be an interesting one because you show people that point, that truth. You take them to Acts 10. And Acts 10 is about Peter. Peter, oh, here it is. This is for us. What's Peter eating? Right? What, what's the, the, the Pope of the first church eating, right? In Acts 10, 14, Peter is shown a lot of unclean animals, the bacon and the pork chops. And Peter says, not so, Lord, I will refuse. This is a test, isn't it? You made it pretty good. I refuse. He says, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. You see, Peter is following the law of clean and unclean animals. So as late as Acts chapter 10, if you were to go from Leviticus to Acts chapter 10, you're finding all of God's people eat according to Leviticus 11 verse 2. Jesus never had bacon, right? And he's the one that said, I came that you have my, might have life and might have it abundantly. 
So apparently, having life abundantly is unrelated to eating bacon. Acts 10, verse 14. I, I, I'm, I'm obsessed with bacon, aren't I? Uh, Acts 10, verse 14. He says, not so. Now turn to 1 Timothy 4. You say, well, where is our menu? Well, if we understand that where the church epistles are found, or where God's revelation about the church and instructions for the church are found, in 1 Timothy 4, Paul talks about food. And he gives very different instructions than what Peter knew in Acts 10, 14. Paul says there are those who forbid to marry and command to abstain from meats in verse 3. But God has created these meats to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. If you know the truth and you believe and know the truth, then every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. Today, you can eat anything you'd like as long as you're doing it knowing the truth. You don't make someone eat something they don't want to eat because they don't know the truth. You don't do that. You can't force them to eat something. But if you know the truth, you know what God is doing regarding food and other things, then you can eat what you like. What's this mean? That you go to someone's house and we don't eat that here. Well, then you don't eat it either, right? But if you go to their house and they say, we eat that here, you don't say, wow, sorry, that's unholy. Right? You eat the thing because there is no unholy thing. To eat, you see. And so this is grace dispensation. And so, you, again, you see the example here, just how God's menu has changed throughout the scripture. Okay? Look at Matthew 3, verse 11. I've got to pick up the pace here a little bit. There are hundreds of these differences, folks, and you can use any one of them. You don't have to teach all of them at the same time. Any one of them. Just to bring them up to people, to show them that God's instructions change. So what do you do about that? Why did his instructions change? And which ones are we to follow? Because every time his instructions change, there's implications. You say, why does it matter about food? And why does it matter about whether you study or not, or the circumcision or baptisms? Because it matters about who you think you are, right? Your relationship to Christ, and what you're supposed to be doing for the Lord. Your service to Christ. Those things matter. So that's the jump. Any one of these things, you say, well, what's God doing that changes? And then when they say, well, I'll pick that one. Okay, but why? And that means if we pick that one, we're wrong, Right? And that means the verse after that is also wrong, right? Get them to realize that there is a fellowship, a relationship, a partnership we have with Christ today that matters for our ministry. You can't just grab everything you want from everywhere in the Bible. Matthew chapter 3. I recall the story that was told to me once of Matthew 3 verse 11 where they were trying to make a pastor see the fellowship of the mystery. Okay, from Matthew 11. And they present this verse. And you could do the exercise with me or with your friends. Count how many baptisms are in this verse. We're not talking about how you baptize, or like whether it's three times, or whether it's once, or name of the Father, or the Son, and the Holy Ghost, or whether it's water with immersion, or water with sprinkling, or fire hose. We're just reading the verse and counting how many there are. And the 3 verse 11, John says, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. One. Right? He that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. Two. And with fire. Three. There are three baptisms in one verse. Okay? The story that was told to me of showing this verse to a pastor saying, well, how many baptisms are in there? The pastor says, one. They read it together out loud. I baptize you with water. He baptizes you with the Holy Ghost. There's at least two. There's one. Why was the pastor so adamant that there's only one? Look at Ephesians chapter 4. He was ignoring the plain words on the page because in his mind, he knew Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 5. Where Paul says in Ephesians 4 in his epistle to the church about the church and our ministry, he says there's one Lord, one faith. How many baptisms? One baptism. There's three in Matthew 3.11. There's one here. Which one's right? How many times do you have to be baptized? I mean, let's just get it straight. I mean, how many? There's more than 12 baptisms in your Bible. You can make a list of 12 different baptisms. So when the church says that God left the church the ordinance of baptism in the Lord's Supper, well, which baptism are you talking about? Right? And of course, there's all sorts of controversy about this. Right? There's only one baptism that ever matters for your salvation. And by the way, baptism is required for salvation. You say, uh-oh, I'm out of here. He's, he's lost it. 
it is required. For, baptism is required for salvation. Not water baptism. What's water to do with your salvation? Right? Not fire baptism. What's the Holy Ghost, what's, what's a judgment of fire have to do with it? Or, or even baptized with the Holy Ghost at Pentecost to speak in tongues. What does that have to do with your salvation? Okay, but churches think that. There's a church over in Greentown that teaches that if you don't show the evidence of speaking in tongues, you're not saved. It happens, right? There are different baptisms. But there's one baptism that you need to be saved. <clears throat> Look at Luke chapter 12, verse 51. Show people Matthew 3. Show them Ephesians 4 and put them before their eyes and say, do you see there's a contradiction in the Bible? Right? Because there is. <clears throat> There's a difference. How do you reconcile those two? We've got to do that if we're to understand the truth. Do we need to baptize three times, two times, four times, one time? How many times? Luke chapter 12, verse 15 and 51. Now, Luke chapter 12 is after Jesus was already water baptized. You recall? You know Jesus was water baptized, right? We can start there. He's water baptized with John the Baptist and that whole situation there, which is a unique baptism and it's different than yours anyway. And you can't follow the Lord in baptism because he was sinless. You were not. So even if you think it should be for the church, it's always a picture, they say, of Christ dying for your sins and you're buried in baptism and the waters about it and you're raised from the dead. And John the Baptist never taught it that way. And he told Jesus, you don't need this. And so if it is a picture of the death and resurrection, why is John the Baptist saying Jesus doesn't need it? I thought Jesus died for your sins. That's interesting. But the reason why John said Jesus didn't need it is because Jesus had no sin. And John said all who are baptized are confessing their sins. You see? Jesus didn't have any sins to confess, so he didn't need to be water baptized. You can't follow Jesus in it unless you have no sins. But meanwhile, Luke 12 is after all that. Jesus has already been water baptized. He's gone through all of that. In Luke 12, verse 51, or verse 50, rather, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? Well, this must be a mistake in the Bible. It must be like something out of order in your Bible, right? Because Jesus was already water baptized. Here Jesus says, I have a baptism to be baptized with in the future. Right? Anyone want to guess what that is? It's his death. Okay. Jesus was baptized into death on the cross. He's talking about going to the cross in that verse. He says, I was already baptized with water, uh, uh, in the, taking the place of Israel, confession of their sins, and now I have another baptism to be baptized with. Which is what? Dying on the cross, a death that I don't deserve. Right? But he says, that's what I came to do. If you need to be involved in any of Jesus' baptisms, I would pick the one on the cross, not the one in the River Jordan. The one on the cross is what pays for your sins. The one in the River Jordan gets you wet, may make you a Jewish priest, doesn't save you. Right? And so, show Luke 12, 51, and how Jesus was baptized twice, and give him a think about that, because people don't think that long about Jesus' baptism. We just spent five minutes on it, and <laughs> That's more than people really think about it. This is how you get them to do Bible study, right? So you make them see that there's something the different is going on by Paul having one baptism. John's preaching three. <coughs> Jesus was baptized twice. Which, where's ours at? That'll help you, by the way, with Romans chapter 6. Romans 6, where Paul says, that as many of you who were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. We're baptized into his water, into his death. Okay? Let's move on here. We're going to get past baptism. <clears throat> what about, oh, should we cover holy days? That's one of the Ten Commandments, isn't it? Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy? Do we have to go to Exodus 20, verse 8 to know to keep the Sabbath and keep it holy? Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy? Oh, Christian doesn't know that. Right? What, what Jew doesn't know that? Keep the Sabbath holy. And Christians say you need to go to church. Why? Well, it's one of the commandments. Really? And you can try to spark the debate about which day is the Sabbath day, and that, that'll get you nowhere, but you know the Sabbath was the seventh day, not the first day. And we're here not on the seventh day of the week, we're here on the first day of the week. Right? Our culture has flipped it around, where the first day on your work calendar is Monday. And you have this in your mind, the first day is Monday? Wrong, the first day is Sunday. The seventh day is Saturday, which is the Jewish Sabbath. Okay? But Exodus 20 says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. No working on the Sabbath day. In Numbers, <clears throat> chapter 15, there's an interesting story here that you can tell your children before they go to bed. You know, have you, you have your Bible study with your kids at home, right? Read Numbers 15 to them. As you're reading through the scripture, verse by verse. In verse 32, 
While the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. They found him gathering sticks. They brought him into Moses and Aaron and into all the congregation. They put him in ward. That's in the local jail. Because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones. And he died as the Lord commanded Moses. I remember when I was in third grade, we had a class field trip. Go to my teacher's house. It was a beautiful house on a hill with trees all around it. And unbeknownst to me, I was down in the, the trees playing. The teacher had told the kids up near the house, don't play with sticks. Some kid had ruined it for us all, hitting girls with sticks. She had set this rule. I didn't know any better, so here I am picking up sticks, just you know, poking around. Justin, stand next to the wall. If anyone who's been to public school, you know this, right? The punishment is stand against the wall. And kids hate that. It's like being in chains, right? Standing against the wall. Ah, oh, I can't leave. And, I, and I, I wasn't one to get in trouble very much in school. So I was just shocked. Sticks? What's wrong with sticks? You read Numbers 15, here's a guy picking up sticks, and God says, stone the guy. That's worse than my third grade teacher. Stone him, right? Well, you say, why is that even there? I mean, where's the mercy, Lord? Mercy, you know. Well, it's because God had just told them, just told them, that you shall do no work on the Sabbath, including picking up sticks. And what's this guy do? See, he's not doing it accidentally. He's not, well, I'm a stick, you know. He's working on the Sabbath, deliberately rebelling against God's command he just gave them. Okay, this is the example God set and said, you break my law, you'll face the punishment. Right? Look at Colossians 2, verse 6. In Colossians 2, verse 6. There were special days they had to observe. There were holy days that they had to observe, which is where we get the, name, the word holiday, right? Holy day. In Colossians 2, verse 6, no, I'm in the wrong verse. 16, I think. 16. Colossians 2, 16. Paul admonishes the Colossians who were being judged. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or of a Sabbath day. Let anyone judge you about the Sabbath day. So where were you on church on Sunday? Right? You should be here on the Lord's day in the Lord's house with the Lord's man. Right? Really? There's three things wrong there. <laughs> There's no Lord's place. There's no Lord's day. And you are no less more God's man than I am. Right? But Paul says, let no man judge you over the Sabbath days. Look at Galatians 4. Galatians 4, verse 10. The Galatians, remember, had a problem of trying to follow the law. They were taught that to be a good Christian, you follow the law. So you can be saved by Jesus Christ, and then if you want to be the best Christian, you just add the law to your life, and you do all the law too, and you do everything the Bible says, and that's the best type of Christian. Well, that's wrong. You can't do everything the Bible says. You're not supposed to follow the law, which is for Israel. You're living under grace. You're supposed to walk that way. Motivated by grace. But Galatians 4, verse, verse 10, Paul says, here's the issue. You observe days and months and times and years. You observe days, like a day is a special day over the next day. So this day is different than Monday and different than Tuesday. This is a holy day. This is the Lord's day, right? This is the Sabbath. The Christian Sabbath, after all, is Sunday, is what they say. But Paul says in verse 11, I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul says, you observe days, I'm scared. Why is Paul scared? I mean, he's just observing a day. I mean, isn't it a good thing people go to church anyway? It's not that they were going to church. It was not that they were trying to revere the Lord. It's not that they were trying to be obedient to the Lord. The scary thing was their motivation. Why were they doing what they were doing? And Paul says, if you're observing a day as holy, you're thinking that that day is contributing to your sanctification. And that's wrong doctrine. I'm scared that you don't understand the fellowship of the mystery, how that your relationship to God is not based upon what day you observe or whether that day is holy or not. Your relationship with God is based upon what Christ did for you on the cross and that alone. We glory in the cross, not a special day, right? And so I've had people who condemn me for not observing the high holiest day of Christianity, which is what? Christmas, right? You, you call yourself a Christian? You don't observe Christmas? Whoa, whoa, that just scared the daylights out of me. If you say that to me, I'm scared that you think that by you observing Christmas it makes you a better Christian. 
Isn't that the Galatian problem? See, that was the issue. The issue was, it's not that they were doing something, like going, meeting together on a day or something like that. It was their motivation. Why do you think, you're do, what, what do you think that does for you? He says, I'm scared of you, lest I've labored in vain. Because if you think that day is holier than the next day, you've missed out on Christ, crucified. You see? So he's concerned about the doctrinal understanding. That's the issue. But you see how this is different? That's the point. This is different than, than, than uh, Exodus 20, then Numbers 15, the days. Do we observe them? Or are we in danger of being stoned if we work on the Sabbath? Or as Paul says, let no man judge you according to the Sabbath. Let no man judge you. Right? Hmm. Well, you've got a dilemma now. God tells two different things in the Bible. Which one are we going to follow? Look at Mark chapter 10. <clears throat> Mark 10, 17. One of the few times in the Bible that um, you find this question so clearly asked, and it's asked to Jesus. I mean, you wouldn't want anyone else to be able to answer this question but Jesus himself. Mark 10, verse 17, the question is clearly, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? You want to live forever, what do I do? And we have the benefit of hearing Jesus' response. Jesus says in verse 19, thou knows the commandments, don't commit adultery, don't kill, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't defraud not, honor thy father and mother, you know, the rest, etc., etc. Right? I put the etc. in there. But he listed at least four or five of them there. You know the commandments. How do you have, what shall I do to have eternal life? Jesus said, do the commandments. That's interesting, because I trust Jesus Christ's work on the cross for my sins to have eternal life. And Jesus himself, in his earthly ministry, said, if you want to have eternal life, do the law. I think it's different. Isn't that different? What do you do with that? I mean, he said that. Now, some people will try to excuse Jesus and say, well, he was just trying to show this person his sin. You know, he, he was using the law to show him that he was a sin and he couldn't do the law. So that when the guy groveled and said, oh, I can't do it, all that stuff, God, Jesus would say, oh, well, then just trust me. But look at the next verse. The guy answered and said, I have observed all from my youth. I have did it all. Right? In verse 21, Jesus beheld him, loved him. Jesus didn't say, you hypocrite. He said, now this is a guy that's doing what God wants. He loved him and said, one thing you lack. There's only one more thing, brother. Right? Sell whatever you have, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come and take up the cross and follow me. He said, I used to be a carpenter. No more. <laughs> Quit my job. Sold all I got. Now, you know, I'm leading people in the kingdom. Sell what you got. Whatever you got, sell it and give it to the poor. He says that no less than three times in his ministry, he tells his disciples to sell all that they have. He's not saying, pay your tithe this week, so make sure you sell 10% of what you have. Sell all that you have <clears throat> and give it to the poor. By the way, if you sell everything you have and give it to the poor, what's that make you? Poor. <laughs> Wait a minute. If you sell everything I have and give it to myself, you know. The whole point here is that they were going to trust Jesus for provision, Right? Is that you provide their daily bread? Oh, didn't they pray that? Oh, yeah, they did. Sell everything you got. Have total dependence on me to provide your daily bread, your daily clothes. I will lead you to this kingdom where you have all these things. Right? So, yeah. If you thought that was the instruction, that's what you do. So, Jesus says, do the law to have eternal life. Then he says, sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Now, <clears throat> turn to 1 Timothy 5, verse 8. These verses are such... In such stark contrast, it's very hard to know how anyone cannot see the difference here. And I, I believe that if you show people these verses, they will, these inspired by the Holy Ghost, they will see the difference. I and mean, people have brains. God gave them brains for a reason. They can see the difference. The only problem you'll have is a lot of people will want to acknowledge it. Right? But remember last week I said our goal is not to make people believe it. It's to make them see it. Because maybe they've never seen the difference. Maybe they've never thought about it before, right? Everything in the Bible's mine. Well, what about this verse and that verse? Which one's yours? Help them to see, open their eyes that the Bible is contradictory information, and we have to choose one. And the question is, on what basis do we do that? Right? And this is the conversation that you have. First Timothy 5, verse 8. Paul says, If any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Whoa. Jesus says, Sell everything you have, follow me which means you have nothing left, which means you can't provide food for your family. You have to trust Jesus to provide your daily bread. In 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, it says, if you don't provide for your own, your own family, your own house, you are worse than an infidel to deny the faith. So either you sell everything you have 
and Paul says you deny the faith, or you provide for your family and you disobey Jesus. That's a conundrum, folks. People don't even think twice about money with the Lord, typically. No one the pastor has to remind them that, you know, God has given you stewardship of all his money. It's not your money, it's God's money. And I'm God's man. So, I'm here to collect. You know? That's typically how people think about money, and that's it. But no one goes home and says, you know, God, what do you want me to do with my money? They, don't, they typically don't do that. Right? 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, though, it says that you need to provide for your own. If this is your instruction, then you'd be wrong to sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Right? Because if it means you can't pay your electric bill and not providing for your family, provide food on the table, then you're disobeying God in 1 Timothy 5, verse 8, who sent Paul. But you've got to have the assurance, the faith, to know that if you're obeying God here, you're disobeying God in, in, in Matthew, Mark 10, right? Can you sleep at nights with that? You see, you've got to be able to understand that God does things differently, right? They couldn't eat pork. Can you sleep at nights by eating pork chops? Really? What, what, what persuasion, what kind of selfish rebellion do you have that you're able to eat anything you want against God's command? Or do you understand that God instructs different people, different things at different times, and you're convinced and persuaded that what God is doing with me and how I relate to him is according to the fellowship of the mystery, not according to the law, not according to the Old Testament, not according to the covenants, not according to the Hebrew religion and their kingdom. You see, you've got to understand this doctrine. And we're trying to show you the contradictions that you can show people to make them see there is a difference. That's the first step. I just rambled off a bunch of stuff, but they're not going to see that the first time. You've got to show them that there is differences that they have to reconcile. They have to choose one. They can't do everything in the scripture. You can move on to tithing. We talked about money, but tithing falls right naturally after that. You know, almost every Christian thinks you should tithe. And the most popular tract at our fair that people, grabs people's attention is the tract that says 39 reasons why you should stop tithing. And people are, wow! Some people take it because they want a tax deduction or they want to, you know, they want to be able to save money. Other people take it, though, the more spiritual, pious Christians say, you can't say that, because how do churches get money if you don't tithe? As if the only way for anyone else to get money is if they take it from you. There's another way. You can give it to them. <laughs> that's different. That'll change your philosophy on a lot of things. But that's the difference. But Christians think that you should tithe, but ask a Christian where in the Bible it tells them to tithe. Do you even know? Show me, tell me a verse where in the Bible God instructs anybody to tithe. You know one. Again, Jeopardy music. Most Christians don't. They've been taught by tradition to tithe. They know the pastor uses verses, but they can't remember them. Right? But where is the law that you're supposed to tithe? I give you a couple on the outline there. Leviticus 27 verse 30 is where the first time you see it show up, apart from Abraham and his tithing Melchizedek. In the law, Leviticus 27, it, says, it talks about tithing. And it says a tenth, which is what tithe means, a tenth, right? A tenth, and it says of all the fruit of the, the increase of the fruit of the field. The law of tithing for Israel was if you had increase this year of crops from last year, if you had an increase, you take a tenth of the increase and you give that to God. Crops. And then there was a tithe of the animals. If you raise animals, you're not a farmer, you're a, what you, a farmer, what do you call that? One who raises animals, a husbandman, a husband, right? You raise the animals. If you have an increase of your animals, every tenth animal that passes over the rod, that's the tithe. Every tenth animal. Even if it's your favorite. <laughs> the tithe, that's God's. The tenth, that's God's, right? Here's the question you don't often think about. What if you don't have ten animals? What if you only have nine? How many animals pass the rod? Do ten animals pass the rod? No, only nine animals pass the rod. Do you tithe? Nope. Interesting. God's tithing system had an accommodation for the poorer people. Right? If you don't have ten animals to tithe, the tenth one doesn't cross the rod, you get to keep all nine. But when you get that tenth one, that's God's. The eleventh one's yours, the twelfth one's yours, yeah. number twenty's God's, right? The tithe was of animals and crops. Okay? You see, yeah, that was just how they used to do it. I mean, now we give money. Or Federal Reserve notes or whatever it is, you know. We have gold coins. No, the tithing was food, animals, and grains. Okay? And Deuteronomy 14, it gives an accommodation. It says if you cannot bring the animals to the temple, if you can't bring them, because, I mean, you don't have the money or you have another appointment or something, you can't actually bring the grain. You don't have a semi-truck to tr drive it there. Then you can convert the grain and animals to money with a percent interest, with a percent increase, right? And then you can bring the money to the temple. Okay? That's only if you could not bring the food and the animals. By the way, what does this mean for people who were not farmers? 
We've we got a whole lesson on this on the website. It's a fascinating study. I actually studied the Bible on tithing. It's more than what you've been told. Different than what you've been told, right? But what happens if you don't farm? You say, well, I don't farm. I just, uh, you know, write computer software, <laughs> right? Um, there's nothing crossing the rod there. And there's no increase to the fruit. The people in the service industry don't tithe. Only the increase of the land and the increase of the animals. Why? Because the land was God's. The animals came from God. And if you're cooking breakfast at the local Israel diner, you're not paying the tithe. See, because the tithe's already paid on the animals. And I, I don't want to get into it. There's a whole lot of details on this. You can study it for yourself. But the point here is, is look at 2 Corinthians 9. If you've been told to tithe 10%, you've been told wrong. Twice. Once, because you're not under the law of tithing. Secondly, because it's not just 10%. Israel's tithe was upwards to 30%. There was three or four different tithes. One of the tithes you were told to spend on anything your soul lusted after. You take 10% of your tithe and you have a party. That's what Deuteronomy 14 says. The pastor never tells you that one. You know why they had a party? They were required by law to have a party so that they could rejoice in God. Imagine that. It's like your mom saying, we're going to have a good time tonight. You will. You know. God said, you will tie 10% and have a party and you will like it so you can rejoice in me. Right? Interesting. That sounds like a God I can worship. Second is 9 verse 6. Paul says, in verse 7 rather, every man according as he purposes in heart, his heart, so let him give. He's talking here about money. Let him give, not grudgingly of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Every man as he purposes in heart, let him give as he purposes in his heart. Now, the law is something that's imposed on you from outside. The tax man cometh. Okay? Your heart is your will, your desire. If you don't desire to give money, then you don't give money. That's what Paul's saying. Because he says it's not of necessity. It's not of grudgingly. If you give grudgingly, and if you give because you think it's of necessity upon you, then Paul says you would be wrong to give. Right? Well, that's pretty much everyone under the tithe system, right? That's why you shouldn't tithe, is because it imposes a necessity upon you, a law over you, a curse upon you that Jesus Christ took upon himself, right? Grace tries to change the purpose of your heart. And if you can't purpose in your heart to provide uh, of yourself, of your time, of your resources to do God's work, then you've got growing to do. That's just the bottom line. That's it, right? But you purpose in your heart. And if you don't purpose in your heart, you don't give. What Paul says about giving is very different than what the law said about tithing. Okay? There's a big difference in how you eat, how you spend your money, how you invest and save for the future. There's a big difference in how you get water baptized, whether you're circumcised or not, whether you follow the law. All these are differences in the Bible. You can show people these differences and then just ask the question, which one do you do? And why? Right? Make them acknowledge that there is a difference. There's got to be a way that we take the Scripture and understand what God is doing. Make men see the fellowship of the mystery means you eventually lead them to the point where they can see the relationship we have with God is based upon the mystery of the gospel, which is God's grace toward us, Christ's finished work on the cross, and us being members freely of the body of Christ. Everything that we do, everything that we are, every ministry we have is based on that truth. Okay? And if someone tries to take something from the law, you know, or take something from Israel's covenants, or from the Garden of Eden, this is not according to the mystery. You see? So th this is another way to do this. We might have a lesson three on this, but uh, hopefully there's some more of examples today of how you can make men see, just comparing these different verses, some of them more benign than others, but all of them necessary for people to see that God instructs different things to different people. Okay? And so again, um, making all men see means first you need to see it, Secondly, you need to know how to show someone. And thirdly, you need to open your mouth to make it known, as Paul said, to pray for him about. Any comments? Any questions? All right. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you most of all this morning for the fellowship that we have with you, your son, with the body of Christ. Uh, this fellowship that is, is, wasn't always talked about in your scripture, but you've seen fit in your wisdom to reveal it to the church 2,000 years ago. And I pray that we would make all men see what this fellowship is. It's fellowship with a mystery. Uh, so they would understand the glories of your grace and the riches we have by it and the power of your cross to save us upon belief and to give us resurrection when we die. Lord, we thank you for all your blessings. Amen.